Yes. Ms. Taylor, please. Ms. Taylor, you say that you are prepared to do everything to solve AIDS. I wonder, are you also prepared to be a fair runner to a new way of life that is sustainable and popular to spread the disease? If that would stop the disease, of course. Uh, at the moment, I have no partners in life. And that should surely help. Yeah, this morning, I saw an actress on TV saying that she would have kissed a man she didn't already know if she was uh, doing a new TV series. Do we act in the same way? Uh, no, I don't Can believe I, I would. I, my son was a twin. He has a now five-year-old twin sister. They drank from the same bottle. They took baths together every night. My son would fall down. I didn't know it was a result of the virus, but I find out now that it was. I would kiss his wounds. Neither my husband, my daughter, nor myself have even been exposed to the virus. Can we end that? Does that end those questions? Thank you. Thank you. Could I, yes, could I have the question? Uh, I, I heard you say just a moment ago you haven't officially approached anyone yet. Does that mean in your role here you will be officially approaching Hollywood celebrities? I'll be approaching many people from all walks of life, business people, um, people in this industry, and many others. Pardon? Will your role primarily be raising funds? That's part of my role, one of the functions. And the other? Well, I'm on the board of directors uh, to contribute ideas and uh, give my support whenever I can, travel, give lectures if necessary. Um, Answer questions, intelligent and unintelligent, if I possibly can. <laughs>
1991, she established the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, which provides funding to AIDS service organizations that assist those living with HIV and AIDS, both here and abroad. Her philanthropic work has earned her the admiration and gratitude of people the world over and has brought her a number of awards, including the French Legion of Honor. She is passionate in her commitment to conquer AIDS, armed with extraordinary beauty, talent, intelligence, and determination. And undergirded by the people's love and admiration for her, she has been a powerful force and a major player in the exciting progress towards finding a vaccine and, yes, maybe even a cure for this disease. She has made a profound difference in how the world views this illness and in the lives of so many people with HIV and AIDS. As one of the world's best known women, Elizabeth Taylor is of the firm belief that celebrity is wasted if it is not used to benefit others. Her commitment to their cause bears impressive witness to this. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a well warm National Press Club welcome to Elizabeth Taylor. about the AIDS epidemic. I spoke of fear. I spoke of society's fear of AIDS and the fear of young, vibrant people facing their own mortality. I spoke of the need for everyone to do their part in caring for those sick and all the need for all of us to take it all to a personal responsibility in reducing the risk of HIV transmission. I spoke of the need of governments and researchers alike to unite and wage war against this insidious disease. When I spoke here, there were 38,000 cases of AIDS reported in the United States. As I stand before you today, there are five over 500,000 cases in the U.S. and 22 million infections around the world. I just returned from an AIDS conference in Vancouver where I was heartened by and exhilarated by the news the promising treatments. They will profoundly change the lives of some people. Although since I was last here, some things are better, some things are not. Given the relatively short time that we have known that the existence of HIV science, science has revealed a huge and detailed body of knowledge about the way the virus works, in many cases, this increased knowledge has greatly benefited research of other illnesses. Treatment of opportunistic uh, infections has improved, meaning healthier and longer lives living for, with people with HIV. It has been demonstrated that prevention programs can, without a doubt, reduce the rate of new infections. And the fear, the fear of contagion, and the fear of stigma of all those infected, although still present, have become less extreme. With all this good news, it might seem that we can relax and re resume business as usual. I have a really deep concern that for many the news of progress has already developed into a sense of complacency. 
but this progress gained at such great cost, combined with the daily tragedy, continued new infections, is precisely why now is not the time to turn back. The news of dramatically promising treatments, particularly combination therapies with protease inhibitors, is a sign that we are finally seeing the benefits of 15 years of hard work. Research, by its very nature, takes time. It is only now, after these long years of it, of investment, advocacy, sacrifice, that we are all seeing the real fruits of our collected labor. However, we must not allow this bright glimmer of hope to overshadow the terrible problems of discrimination that will surely follow. I speak of the issues of excesses and cost that we must now address. <laughs> For the poor, the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the new therapies are too expensive or unavailable, simply put. Under current health care programs, whether in the U.S. or in the developing world, there are over 90% of new infections are occurring. The most promising treatments will be least available to those who need them most. Yes, the new drugs are expensive, but it has not yet been proven impossible to subsidize for the poor. We know that AZT reduces maternal fetal transmission by two-thirds, but an inadequate health care system means AZT is inaccessible for poor women in our own nation much less in the developing world. In the U.S., we must expand funding of AIDS drug assistance program so that all patients will get the expensive drugs that can prolong their lives. This program should give the chance of protease inhibitors and other effective therapies to the poor and not just the rich. We must also make people aware of their right to benefit from scientific discovery, adequate health care, and access to treatments when they need them. And in regard to the developing world, the convenient cliches of lack of resources and systems are advanced again and again and yet we have actually tried to recast our global priorities, asking not why, but why not. We cannot dismiss the revolutionary possibilities of providing better drugs and improved care for those who need it most, unless we face these terrible inequities and ensure that all people have access to and can afford all the treatments they need. Our work will never be over. Prevention programs that grew from common sense and experience are now proven by science. But there remains still a deep reluctance to act upon this knowledge. Needle exchange, for one, is an area where misunderstanding, social 
squeamishness, and lack of compassion have prevailed over sensible public health practice. Let me give you the facts. Each year in this country, there are estimated to be 41,000 new HIV infections. And three quarters of these will be among drug users, their sexual partners, or their offspring. Research has demonstrated that needle exchange programs reduce HIV transmission by at least half and do not, do not increase drug use. It's needle exchange. Think of all the human lives we could save. Think of all the health care costs we could reduce if only we could in institute needle exchange programs in every state of the union. We live in a society that above all values each and every human life to continue to withhold the means of self-protection from part of our population is not benign neglect. It is not a deliberate act of redeemed and selective murder. It is an act clearly unacceptable in any country that calls itself civilized. It is an act of murder. We must lift the ban, the federal ban on needle exchange programs. We must overturn state legis legislature. We must enroll public support, for now is not the time to turn back. As the epidemic has changed its focus, we must other prevention programs for Latinos, African Americans, Native Americans, young gay men and women who are now at disproportionate risk. Gay men have shown just how successful a community could respond to AIDS could be. Young gay men never lived through the horror of the 80s are a new generation whose behavior has not been impacted enough by existing prevention programs. And as a result, in New York City, a teenage gay man today has a 50% chance of becoming infected before he reaches his 25th birthday. We must invigorate prevention efforts immediately to reach our young people before it's too late. And now in this country, do we have a plan to tailor our strategy to the evolving face of AIDS? This spring, a report was released that could prove that every roadmap that we so desperately need for our future, prepared by a large panel of the most prestigious and respected scientists, the Levine Report offers a blueprint for AIDS research in this country. Since the U.S. investment represents 85% of all AIDS research, it is critical that our work be planned and coordinated in the most efficient manner. The report asks for increased focus on investigator-initiated in research, 
which would allow the brightest and best minds in science to define the questions that must be answered now. It calls for expanded prevention efforts, including an intensive pursuit for a safe and effective vaccine to protect all people. Significantly, it also recommends that the Office of AIDS Research at the NIH receive full budgetary authority to implement these other strategic recommendations as fast as possible. Without this, our national effort will remain divided, unfocused, and uncoordinated. Despite its strong, strong support for the NIH, the House is not willing to give the OAR the authority to lead our national research effort, giving the AIDS budget to the NIH, but not allowing the OAR to manage it. It's like sending the best troops into battle without a general to lead the charge. Science and experience have shown that challenging the established norms may be required to bring AIDS under control. Access, access to experimental drugs, needle exchange, and sex education for very young people have worked. But Congress wants to maintain the status quo. If they do not have eyes, they do not see. If they do not have ears, they do not hear. If they do not have hearts, they surely cannot feel, even as ours are breaking. Yes, we have in our hands the knowledge, the talent, the years of work. We have a commitment that is wrought only by suffering and sacrifice. Within our grasp are the eventual solutions. We have faced the right questions, but the answers we need, political leadership, and scientific vision. To be humane, we must lift the ban on needle exchange. To be fair, we must develop a vaccine for the many and not just for the few. To be equitable, we must ensure universal access to treatment and care. To protect our future, we must support prevention programs above all for the young, to allow women to preserve their own health. We must develop the methods of prevention that they themselves control. And in order to get this done, we need a strong OAR to begin this work now, for tomorrow, for once, and for all. to take uh, this moment to give 
Dr. Matilda Krim, uh, a gift for AMFAR from ETAF for $500,000. symptoms of a heroin uh, user, the mother, uh, has the same problems as a mother with AIDS. I don't think uh, breast cancer uh, patients should have their money removed from cancer research. I think it should be divided. I think it should, uh, it shouldn't, a dying person, dying child, a dying young adult, is a dying person. And we should delegate the monies to those who are sick, no matter how they got sick, whether they got run over by a car, or whether they have the unfortunate misfortune of being um, uh, a heroin user. Uh, it will eventually spread. That it isn't that just that one heroin user we're talking about. It's the women they affect and the children they affect the population because they use needles. It's the, the population around them that spreads, which is why we want needle exchange, because it is the largest way now of spreading AIDS. So if you can stop that with uh, how much is a needle, I don't know, I'm not a physician, I'm not a pharmacist, but uh, I don't think they're all that much. I don't think they're probably as much as one of the Senator Dole's campaign stickers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this question, is a very popular political question and portrays a misunderstanding of HIV and illness generally. Illnesses are all interconnected. When we learn about HIV, we learn about retro retroviruses, we learn about viruses generally, and we learn about treating illness generally. I can give you an example of that. I have HIV. I have a cancer-like disease called Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a byproduct of my illness. Kaposi's sarcoma is not unique to HIV. It existed before AIDS and it will exist after AIDS. Before AIDS, there were no treatments whatsoever for Kaposi's sarcoma. The treatments now exist. And I, as a person with HIV, will benefit from that. But so will all the other people who have Kaposi's sarcoma that is not connected to HIV. In a thousand different ways, HIV relates to all other illnesses. Illnesses are not in competition with one another. They are interconnected. And any scientist or doctor will tell you that the the things we learn from HIV will help everyone in this room. You will ultimately be very grateful for the research devoted to HIV.
You spoke of uh, financial problems, preferred HIV and AIDS therapy now uses combinations of three drugs, oftentimes. This is more expensive. So is um, testing for viral load in the bloodstream. Where is this extra money going to come from, both for uh, people who are insured and with in their health care and people who are not? At the moment, it's coming from people like us. Where is the government helping us? Where is the government helping its people? The people that have AIDS are still United States citizens. We are doing the work. APLA is doing the work. Uh, organizations in New Jersey, in uh, uh, Kansas, wherever, are doing the work. It's, it's home grassroots, isn't it? It's people like that, like us, that don't get sorry, that do it because we feel it should be done. Um, and dedicated scientists who feel that it's necessary, mandatory, that it be done, and it is, as uh, Dr. said, it is going to affect directly cancer. The minute there's a cure for AIDS or a, a, a cure for cancer, it's going to go hand in hand. So whichever one comes first uh, helps the other one at the same time. They go hand in hand, and we've been fighting cancer for almost a hundred years. So we, you know, we're really, we're trying in our efforts not to exclude other people, but to include them. There is a clash between people in Hollywood who support animal testing to work on treatment of diseases like AIDS and those who fervently oppose animal testing. How do you handle that dispute? Is there any prospect of compromise? Well, uh, I'm an animal activist, so I'm not getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've come to terms with that. How, how do you justify? They can test on me. <laughs> <laughs> Celsi, a small Washington area biotech company, has developed a vaccine that helped laboratory mice fend off HIV. How soon do you believe there will be a vaccine for humans? I think you'd have to ask the doctors that. I uh, a vaccine effort is extraordinarily important in HIV. Clearly, we're talking about how much money it costs to treat an illness. Prevention has been the major way that any viral illness has been taken care of in the past, and, and no, no much more so in terms of HIV AIDS. Part of the Levine report that Ms. Taylor mentioned, part of the criticism of past efforts has been not enough attention to making a vaccine uh, against HIV AIDS. Uh, we certainly need to put a lot more effort in it. It's a very difficult problem. This virus presents a moving target. This virus infects the very cells of the immune system that we need to um, cooperate, to help uh, produce a vaccine. And so it's going to be a difficult effort, but we do see um, some, some hope. We need more money, um, and we certainly need people to pay attention to the Levine Report in putting more resources into this important endeavor. New HIV infections have fallen among older homosexual men, but federal research shows riskier behavior among younger men. You referred to that sort of problem. Are targeted interventions with young people more effective than mass media campaigns? What's the best word to get, what's the best way to get the word to young people? Uh, education. Uh, get the word out there and keep on uh, banging it in, showing them statistics. Uh, asking them to visit a hospice. Um, they could be a helper. They could. Um, help somebody that already is in his 20s in a hospice and walk his dog for him. 
uh, some, some of these kids have to probably see it uh, with their own eyes. Uh, a lot of these new generation um, AIDS patients aren't encouraged, of course, to do that by their parents because their parents think, whew, well, we got over that one. And the teens now think, oh, well, that was just Bill Vogue's. Uh, war safe. But that, that's the same problem we had 10 years ago. The youth, uh, I, I, the young think they're invulnerable. And, and that's, you know, uh, the thing of being young. You think uh, you're indestructible. I don't know how you go about making it, you know. One of the things that uh, Evans has been demonstrated some grants we gave to uh, grassroots organizations that were trying to reach teens was uh, the development of uh, peer education. This is very important uh, to have people listen to their peers. And it's good, it's valid also for young people. Teenagers listen to other teenagers. And they can very well, some of them, be educated to teach others, and it works. And throughout the world recently, uh, one of the things reported in, uh, in Vancouver was that, in fact, in different countries and in different cultures, intensive, frank, honest, consistent prevention messages have borne fruit and have resulted in a reduction in the rate of transmission of HIV. This could be done here, too. So it goes back to you, the media, helping us by word of mouth making it still a public issue in your newspapers, not uh, an issue that has passed or, uh, oh, they're on their way into a vaccine, which we're not. Um, there is hope for one, but until it's on the table, nobody should get their hopes up about it, it to the degree that they think they don't have to do something. You can help. You can keep it alive. You can keep the issue alive to the young people or to their parents who may read the newspapers more to let their children know that the risk is out there. Whenever they have sex, uh, the risk is out there. Whenever they uh, use a needle. The risk is out there. And it's not going to go away. It's not going away. I read the statistics to you. It's, it's not going away. It's hopeful because there's this glimmer of hope. This glittering <laughs> glimmer. <laughs> We've, we've spoken about the problems in giving the message to young people. Uh, there's another group uh, that has a disproportionate share of AIDS, and that is African Americans. The rate of HIV infection is one of every 50 black men, one of every 100 Hispanic men, and one of every 250 white men. Is there some special strategy that we should have to deal with the African Americans among us? I, uh, unfortunately, the um, African American male, the Hispanic American male, um, live in l less advantaged groups, areas, um, neighborhoods, and it's hard, it's much harder for them to get the kind of treatment because they are the ones that need it the most. The statistics show that. A lot of, um, I think there's a lot of pride. Like it's, it's not going to, um, it's not going to happen to me. Like children uh, have a lot of, not children, teenagers. It's not going to happen to me. Not, nothing can happen to me. Um, I think it's an economic problem. What would you say? 
It's an economic problem uh, for lack of access to information, yes. It's also, this is also an issue that can be put in your lap, that it is the responsibility of the media and the press to target messages that are culturally appropriate to certain communities so that the messages get heard, get paid attention to. And, um, and it's the responsibility of these communities to see the learned statistics and also do their internal grassroots work. You know, the, the only community that really has responded to this tragedy in a way that is uh, generous, responsible, and effective has been the gay community. The others have done very little for themselves. It's time that all of us, all communities, become aware of AIDS and fight it appropriately. May, may I add to that? Sometimes it's helpful to personalize these issues, and that's why I'm going to mention once again my own circumstance. My drugs, by themselves, without doctor's visits and any other medical treatments, cost more than $100,000 a year. $100,000 a year for people who need protease inhibitors as well as the day-to-day -day drugs to prevent opportunistic infections. I can get it just by chance by the fact that I'm an upper middle class man. That's not right. Ms. Taylor is exactly right that the issue now is equity, at least within the United States. And we can, if the citizens and the government really cares, we can provide the medication to all the people who are in need. We should be If the government cares. Yes. If the next president cares, because he will lose a lot of voters if he doesn't, because they won't be around. Where does personal responsibility fit into this equation? What should be the message uh, for how people should live their lives? Pardon? Personal responsibility they, and in, in individual behavior to avoid um, situations in which they contract AIDS. You mean sexual behavior? Or drug use? Well, uh, avoid drugs if you're on heroin. But go get help. <laughs> uh, abstinence uh, among the young is not a remote idea. Um, it's a pretty good one. <laughs> I was married a virgin. <laughs> kids uh, won't go for abstinence and one understands about young hormones and so forth and how difficult it is, at least practice safe sex. Everybody knows about it, everybody's heard about it, but they just don't do it because they don't think it's macho. If you listen to Sally Jesse Raphael or any of those programs, which I did a lot of when I had three hip surgeries. <laughs> uh, they talked about sex with teenagers. Uh, it was like program after program after program. And the kids just simply denied the possibility that it could happen to them. You know, they, they were, uh, you know, they weren't like that. They uh, knew Jerry for, they had four days. He was a good, good kid. Uh, well, my mom liked him. She met him once. Uh, they don't get it. And until they get the fact that Safe sex means using a condom, 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 or <laughs> abstaining. Uh, just those two simple things uh, is going to go on, and especially in teenagers. Can I just add something to that? I, I also think it's very important to 
to recognize that there are some individuals and some populations that don't have the ability to use the information that they have. There are some, some women um, who are married in relationships and don't have the ability to say no. Uh, in some populations, males will not use the male condom. Um, and that's why we need more that's research. Why we've got to work on a for a while. Exactly. We need more research on, on female controlled methods, on vaginal microbicides, on local conditions, on the female condom, and actually one does exist. Yeah. Uh, and we need the money uh, to put those out. Absolutely. Then there's the other situation of the drug addict who knows that he or she does, should not share needles, wants to buy needles, and cannot because state laws prohibit the sale and the possession of needles. So in desperation yes. under the prescription, doctor's approval. That's right. Uh, they're uh, not going to get it. No, they're not going to get it. In fact, the doctors can be punished too for giving prescriptions to people who are addicted. So the in desperation and the, uh, the compulsive need to have that drug, they have to share needles with others, and this is how they get infected with HIV. How can we include more first-hand response from African American and Latin American persons on your panels? Why isn't the National Minority AIDS Council here? Let's pass on up. It's a wonderful organization, but it's another organization. We are AMFAR. AMFAR is represented here today. And Ms. Taylor, does the U.S. You were trying to put AMFAR down, weren't you? No. Yes, you were. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Does the U.S. film industry have a responsibility to send uh, the uh, right message to the young? Uh, well, they're certainly not here today. <laughs> <laughs> I think the film industry is constantly trying to uh, uh, put a message across that will be captivating, will like Philadelphia. Uh, to make a good film like Phil Philadelphia, it doesn't happen. Now, I'm going to put this subject very often. A good film doesn't happen. Uh, out of 20 films, how many good ones are there? You know, and, and Philadelphia just happened to be one. I think they are conscious and are trying, and I think the uh, community of Hollywood is probably one of the more, I don't know about New York, but I would say that uh, Hollywood is probably one of the more active group of uh, citizens in the state, wouldn't you? Hollywood has attempted to address this issue. How many other industries have? This is a universal obligation. Vancouver taught us that there is promise now, but there's only promise. We each individually and collectively as a society ought to undertake to fulfill our responsibilities to end suffering, regardless of its circumstance. Hollywood is doing a reasonable amount. Others of us, other industries, ought to follow suit. This is a collective effort, and we all have our duties. We shouldn't simply point to the media or to Hollywood to say they should do it for us. We can do it ourselves. You can even, frankly, send a contribution to AMFAR. <laughs> Or to ACAF, not send it down for <laughs> Ms. Taylor, what do you regard as your best acting role, and what was your favorite movie role? <laughs> <laughs> People want to know about you. <laughs> My favorite role was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? <laughs> Is that your best? Best performance? I don't think you can never gauge whether you're good or bad, but um, I felt it had probably more energy and more challenge. Do you miss acting? No. <laughs> um, has physical therapy helped with your back problems? Oh, can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs>
that you slouch over the table. Uh, yes, it's helped my, my hips. Thank you. What was the happiest moment of your life? <laughs> I have had many extraordinary happy moments in my life and some really pitiful ones. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on what they might have been? Nope. You are one of the most famous and beloved women of the 20th century. One reason is clearly your beauty. To what else do you attribute your fame? I'm not going to walk into that one. What is the best thing and the worst thing about being Elizabeth Taylor? Probably being Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> um, in a perverse way, does the tabloid's obsession with you keep you in the public eye and thus help sustain your visibility on the AIDS fight? No. They don't talk about AIDS. They talk about who's going to bed with who. Uh, uh, they don't get into um, issues with, that are serious. But they don't keep you in a higher visibility so that you can then use that platform? Well, they did it. use that time when I went on that alien ship. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't say it was for AIDS testing. Then I said, <laughs> What goal or personal ambition have you yet to fulfill in your life? Get through tomorrow. <laughs> After the movie roles of your youth, your most acclaimed work spanned 1956 to 1966. Do you have any regrets at having made so many lesser movies after 1966. Well, I have a very convenient memory. I've forgotten those. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Ribbon seems to have become a political fashion requirement in Hollywood. Has it lost its significance? Do people pin on a ribbon and figure they have done their part? Ah, that's interesting because uh, I noted at the last Academy Awards and the Grammys that nobody was wearing their red ribbons. And I kind of took offense at it. And then somebody said to me, you know, you really shouldn't. It's, if you pay a lip service to something, if you think just wearing a red ribbon is enough, you're not doing enough. It's what you do, where you put your money, if you put your money where your mouth is, uh, not where your ribbon is. Go out and do something and then have a glow in your heart. Uh, wearing a ribbon isn't enough anymore. Before we ask the last question, I would like to give you a mug from the National <laughs> Press Club. Oh. A certificate of appreciation to put next to those lovely Oscars. <laughs> And we would like to ask you a political question. If you were a Virginian, which Warner would you vote for? <laughs> for the U.S. Senate. My Senator John Warner. <laughs> Thank you very much. still for talking.
photographers, they can have a couple of moments up here. I want everyone else to stay seated until Ms. Taylor leaves. And we must confront the collective pain. And once we do, once we achieve that hard-won sense of peace, then, and only then, can we channel our energy and anger at the real enemy, the virus itself. The quilt has taught us much about how, how vibrantly life can be lived and how eloquently it can be lost. It has brought us a sense of closeness in family and community. It has taught us that although we are all different, in some ways we are all the same. It has shown us how to turn our collective groups and griefs into group action. It has so transformed us that our lives will never be the same. I stand here today to ask you to remember. I ask you that you remember and grieve and love and hope. Mostly, I ask that you never forget. For as long as you don't forget, more than 300,000 Americans will not have died in vain. It is now time to unite all our energies into one pure and solid flame. I want you all to extinguish your candle. As you do, say aloud the name of a loved one. Please extinguish your candles. Please call out the name. God love you. Bless you.